where does uric acid come from? How do, how, how do we control the, the uric acid? You kind of mentioned like fructose purines and alcohol. So which, is, which of those is the most important? Well, they're all important, uh, but I, I think that by far and away, the fructose is the player. Yes, alcohol will raise uric acid, certainly purines will. You go online and read about a gout diet, they won't even mention fructose. Uh, it's kind of spooky. You, you kind of understand why when you understand that there's a, you know, really a, um, an effort to make us think sugar is, is okay to eat, though it isn't. But nonetheless, fructose is the big player. It's, it's you know, traditionally been this, a signal for us to make and store fat you know, for probably 15, 16 million years. That's how long, that's when that mutation took place in our primate ancestors. So, you know, it's, it is what we eat uh, traditionally as hunter gatherers, what we would have eaten in the fall to tell us winter is coming to make and store fat. But here's an interesting twist to the story. And that is that you could eat no fructose whatsoever and yet still activate this pathway because we can make our own fructose within our bodies and stimulate uric acid production just as if we'd eaten, you know, dr uh, drank a, uh, a glass of orange juice. And how does that happen? Well, when, for example, the body thinks it's dehydrated when, and that sensing is done because the sodium level is go going up in the blood, we have sensors that detect that elevation of sodium and say, whoa, this person's dehydrated, we better, turn on fructose production, which becomes uric acid, which says make more fat. Now, why in the world would we want to make fat when we're becoming dehydrated? What kind of sense does that make? And to explain that, I want to just have you and your viewers consider, an, let's say an animal that can go three weeks without drinking water, it can walk across a hot environment, walk across the desert. And this animal has a very a peculiar a part of its body called a hump on its back. Now, if you look inside the camel's hump, which is its key to survival, what do you find? You find that it's full of fat, not water. Because when the camel, when you, when I, when a mouse, when a bird uses fat for energy, we create two things, carbon dioxide, which we exhale, and water, metabolic water. So when we store body fat, like the camel, like the whale, like the hummingbird, we are storing a resource, yes, for calories, but also that our bodies can use uh, to make what's called metabolic water. So that gets back to our bodies sensing dehydration because the sodium level went up. It kicks in this pathway to make fructose in your own body, make uric acid, make body fat. So you have a resource to have water. So you're not going to become dehydrated and, and die in the desert. So interestingly, then this explains something that we've puzzled over for many, many years. And that is why is it that people who eat a lot of salt gain a lot of body fat? Why is it that people who eat a lot of, of uh, salt have high blood pressure? Why do they get diabetes? I mean, salt has no calories. And we're all told that, you know, gaining weight is simply calories in versus calories out. Therefore, salt should be totally fine. Well, it isn't. Eating salt raises the salt level in your blood, tells your body we're becoming dehydrated, make fat very quickly and activates this whole pathway. So it really does tend to explain a lot of stuff that we haven't understood in the past about, you know, these mechanisms for making fat, for becoming a diabetic, for raising the blood pressure. So can we just have a maybe a little diversion? Can we talk about fructose and glucose and, and the way that they're metabolized? Because I, I believe it's like very different. And so that would help with the understanding, I think. You bet. Well, fructose and glucose have the exact <clears throat> same chemical formula, meaning the same number of carbons and hydrogens and oxygens, but they're arranged differently. So their shapes are different and they couldn't be more different physiologically like night and day. When we consume glucose or we consume starch that we quickly break down into glucose in the gut, we absorb that glucose through dedicated glucose receptors that gets into our bloodstream. And then through the action of a specific hormone called insulin, 
that glucose is dealt with by being put into various cells like the liver cells and certainly the biggest uh, resource, the muscle cells, and stored in the form of something called glycogen. Fructose metabolism is completely unrelated to that. Fructose, though similar sugar, they're packaged together in nature. In fact, table sugar is half glucose, half fructose, but there couldn't be more, more different in terms of what your body sees. Fructose is the, the sugar of energy storage, while glucose is the sugar of energy utilization right now. When we consume fructose and it makes its way into the bloodstream, what happens is uh, its metabolism immediately consumes energy. It depletes our body of the, the currency of energy, which is called ATP. So it's an energy reducing process and uh, ultimately then is shuttled into the creation of uric acid. And what is so unique uh, in terms of the difference between the two, and I'm glad you brought it up, is in glucose metabolism, at the end of the line, once glucose is dealt with, then our bodies tend to shut off the metabolism. It's done. There are feedback mechanisms to reduce then its metabolism. Fructose, on the other hand, instead of shutting off its, its metabolism, actually enhances its own metabolism. It makes it happen more and more, again, as a survival mechanism. And what is it that enhances that activity? Something called uric acid, who knew? Uric acid actually enhances the, the first enzyme called fructokinase, which is involved in the breakdown of fructose and the consumption of energy. It actually enhances the enzyme uh, that's involved in the creation of more fructose in your body, as we talked about earlier from glucose. So this is a very, very powerful end, uh, system uh, that is in place to keep us alive. And it worked for millions and millions of years when our evolution, our genes, our physiology were in alignment with our world, with our environment, our world of food scarcity, of food instability, when our bodies didn't know and had to prepare, give us an advantage, give us the superpower, if you will, to be able to survive during times of food uh, scarcity. Nowadays, we're experiencing what's called this evolutionary environmental mismatch, meaning we still have all the genes in place, well, all that physiology in place, this pathway that you and I have been talking about, but the environment has changed. Now we're targeting this exact pathway in a time of fructose abundance. Uh, here in America, our fructose consumption from 1970 to 1990 increased 1,000%. So we're pounding this signal, preparing for winter every day of the year, and it never comes. And so we keep packing those nuts away for, you know, like the squirrels do. Uh, in this case, it's body fat in preparation for a time of fasting, and it never arrives. These pathways are working exactly how they've worked for millions of years, but we're signaling them in the wrong way. And that's why the uric acid story is uh, so fascinating. Because from the perspective of our ancestry, and I'm talking about only you know, 17,000 years ago, and then moving back for millions of years, this was a terrific pathway. It was life-saving for us to make a little more fat, to raise our blood pressure, to increase our blood sugar, so that we could power the brain with that blood sugar. And that's the biggest card that we hold in our hand. We're not the fastest animal around. We're not the, uh, the strongest, but we have the biggest brain in proportion to our, we have a big brain. And that powering that brain is our ace in the hole. That's our high card and helps us, helped our ancestors avoid two things, starvation and predation. We didn't get, uh, we could find food because we were clever and we could avoid being eaten by, another animal because again we were clever we were powering our brains briefly where does all this fructose come from i, I mean so there's high fructose corn syrup but well high fructose corn syrup comes from corn and but, yeah. uh, that is technology that was developed at uh, university of oklahoma back in i think 1958 and it took a little while to gain traction and there was some politics involved with that at that time uh you know uh prior to uh, Cuba becoming a communist country, we were getting a lot of our, our sugar uh, from sugarcane uh, from Cuba, 
Uh, but then uh, when that whole situation changed, researchers began looking at other sources of sugar. We've got to have our sugar after all, right? And developed the technology for us to be able to, to derive sugar from corn. And so this is a, a product, you know, I mentioned earlier that table sugar, sucrose is 50-50, fructose and glucose. Well, high fructose corn syrup just begins the fructose level at 55%, but we know there are, there are some levels of high fructose corn syrup that have much higher levels of fructose. And it's a very big advantage for the manufacturers of food products for two reasons, that fructose is much sweeter than glucose, so you don't have to use as much, and it's really, really cheap. So we get that there's a lot of fructose in soda. Many people don't understand that uh, the amount of uh, uh, sugar in orange juice and apple juice is the same as the soda. So there's nothing natural about drinking a 12 ounce glass of organic orange juice. Nothing natural about that at all. Our hunter gatherer forebears didn't, weren't hunting and gathering and suddenly found cartons of orange juice hanging from the tree somewhere. Uh, to bombard our bodies with 36 grams of sugar quickly in the form of drinking a glass of juice when one is thirsty, uh, we can't deal with that in a reasonable way. That fructose is going to make its way to the liver because it overwhelms the intestine and sets all of these processes that we've been talking about into motion. So we, we've noted that... Uh, you know, we all like sugar. There's nobody watching uh, our conversation right now that doesn't have a sweet tooth. It's a survival mechanism. It allowed us to identify foods that were safe because generally in the, in the in nature, poisonous foods aren't sweet. But it also signaled our bodies to make fat, which in, as mentioned, was a, a good thing in the day. But, you know, that idea that we all like sugar hasn't been lost on food manufacturing. Uh, in America, more than 70% of foods on the grocery store shelf uh, that are packaged have added sweetener. They didn't need it, but it's added so that you will like it and you will then buy it. We all like sweet and uh, we're being targeted. Our physiologies are being manipulated to buy those foods. Why? Because they have sugar. We like it. We're not really sure why, but it turns out, you know, that there's there's a sweet threshold, a bliss threshold that brings us such pleasure when we eat those foods. So what does that end up doing? Uh, that addition of sugar to our foods by so many different confusing names, by the way. I ha I listed a whole bunch of them on uh, one page in the book. Uh, are, it's meant to confuse us uh, and, and it's meant to trick us. And it does a really, really good job. And the manifestation of that is this global burden of the pandemic of these metabolic conditions that are really threatening our lifespan.